Welcome to Fully Charged. With Fully Charged Live USA coming up at Circuit of the Americas, we wanted to share some of the things we love about Austin and Texas more broadly. How the state best known for oil and gas also became known as a pioneer in wind and solar. How Austin Energy has been a longtime leader in embracing renewable energy and electric vehicles. First, we're headed to Pecan Street, a fascinating research and product testing laboratory unlike any other, built on what used to be the Austin Airport. But before we do, don't forget to grab tickets for Fully Charged Live, 1st and 2nd February here in Austin. There's a handy link at the top right of this video and more information in the notes below. Today we're at Pecan Street Project, which is a living lab that puts all sorts of data and metrics behind all sorts of energy use, from electricity to water to transportation. But it's more than just one building, it's an overall place, and we're going to go see it. Hi. Hi, good to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome to Austin. <laughs> Thank you very much. First major question, uh -huh. pecan or pecan? Pecan. If you're living, Strong in, the feelings if in, you're this living area. in the south, it's pecan. <laughs> All righty then. Got it down. Are you ready for a tour? I am ready for a tour. All right, Let's we are do it. fully charged. How could we not be? <laughs> Let's go. I thought I'd show you the Miller community. Um, when we first started outfitting houses uh, to do our demonstration project, we needed the, the perfect place to do it. The Miller community uh, is the site of the old Austin airport. Okay. So if you flew into Austin before 1999, you landed right here. And um, it looks it's a little different now. Yeah, it's more than, <laughs> well, it's also a huge kind of experiment. It's right in the middle of Austin, it's 700 acres, and they redeveloped it with housing. We have the Children's Hospital here. Um, office retail and um, there was a lottery to get a lot uh, okay. and so we had very very interested engaged enthusiastic residents about half of our Austin participants are here in the Miller community mm -hmm. you'll find a lot of people here who want to participate in our research strictly for climate reasons mm -hmm. they want to reduce emissions they want to do their part in their own part of home. The solution. Yeah. yeah, both in their home and as part of the research. There's nice um, Model 3. Yeah. And you'll also find people who just want to unplug, they want to get up the grid, yep. stick it to the man, <laughs> yeah, you name yes, it. For sure. And and then there are some people, you know, we're in the we're in a huge university town. And so you have a lot of people who they won't pick it for other climate issues, but they recognize the benefit of public research. Mm -hmm. And so they just are glad to participate. They probably don't even check their portal. Right. They just know that it's going to something where their kids or grandkids might be using that database to get their PhD someday. Right. You mentioned the solar, and I know you've done some looking at south versus west and some conclusions there. Yeah. So it's really interesting. So, you know, when, when most utilities or states or whoever provide incentives to solar owners to help them recoup the costs, a lot of it is based on total output over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And so in, in the Northern Hemisphere, where we are, that means facing your solar panels south. Right. Because you're going to maximize over the course of the year. So that's very good for an individual owner. Um, the problem with the grid in Texas is um, not all year round. Mm -hmm. It's when it's 105 degrees in <laughs> August right. between 4 and 7 p.m. Yep. The sun's in the west. And so we wanted to see if you were to align solar panels facing west, what kind of impact would that have on a home's um, overall grid use? Right. And what we found is that it, not surprisingly, much more closely aligns with demand of the house. Mm -hmm. So if you have some of your solar panels facing west, it's not just good for you as a solar owner, but it's better for the for the utility because they're not now having to provide you power. Mm -hmm. And so our suggestion was that if you're going to provide incentives, if you're a utility or a state and you're going to provide incentives for ins for solar installation, you should include west in that because that west-facing solar is what's best for the grid mm -hmm. as a whole. Sure. We're all used to being steeped in our, uh, with our fellow nerds and stuff. Are you learning anything 
unexpected from this very early adopting community that should inform how we talk to more mainstream audiences? Yeah. I think uh, it's funny. Our electric vehicle experience what is, I think, the most poignant. So if you think way back to when the Volt first came out and EVs were brand new uh, and the only Tesla on the road was the first Roadster. Roadster, yeah. Um, it was being sold as a car to help save the planet mm -hmm. and skip the gas line. Yes, and, and get a hug from a polar bear. And after a couple of years, we asked our electric vehicle owners what they loved about it, and they were like, it's fast, yep. it's quick, <laughs> it's cool, it's fun to drive, it's the fastest car I've ever had. And so I think that the environmental benefit of electric vehicles is going to have to be the secondary benefit. If not third or fourth. <laughs> And, and maybe it'll cost less over time with gasoline, and, um, but the cool factor matters. Right. Americans love their cars. Yes. And if they feel like they're making a sacrifice by getting the right kind of car, I think you're only going to appeal to a certain segment of the population. That then goes to another thing that we've learned about really eager, enthusiastic customers is that there are only so many of them. Right. And if it, I just don't think that we're going to save the world on the backs of a few people. Right. And so if we want these technologies that help reduce emissions and that help clean the air, if we want them to become ubiquitous, um, they need to be easy to use, they need to be cost, cost competitive, and they need to provide some features to people that they wouldn't get from the alternative. So there, when we first uh, unveiled the Volt incentive program we lined up all of our participants in this area here we took a big group photo with a couple Aww. of with a couple of volts it was really neat um, and they were genuine people were genuinely interested in it um, uh, the incentive we provided was the kicker oh, sure because um, we essentially doubled the federal tax credit for them oh, wow. so yeah, that no ended wonder. up being fifteen thousand dollars <laughs> off the price of a car that's yeah. pretty good and then for the west-facing solar, we we added an additional incentive there because you know over the course of the year they'll make a little less off of it, and so we we even that out. Right. So, so. people get to choose how deeply invested. Yeah, they and there are. are some there are some people who signed up, and we haven't heard from them. Yeah. They you know it was a it's a very community minded place. Mm -hmm. And so they went to an open house and their friend was doing it so they did it and you know until they move they were collecting their data right. and um, uh, I guess every once in a while if something needs to be rebooted we'll we'll give them a call but most of the time uh, I would say the majority of the people who are participating are regular of more passive si participants. Yeah, si yeah. silent um, participants, which you know is which is fine. Yeah. After our tour came to an end, Scott invited me into the laboratory to meet the team and have a look at some of their latest projects. All right. Magic happened. All kinds of equipment we can build. Electronics here. How hard are your work days? Uh, they're hard. <laughs> they're hard. Um, it also makes a fantastic degreaser that leaves sure. no residue. Um, we've got uh, uh, electronics assembly we can do up here. We've got some 3D printers. We've got a surface mount oven to, to do printed circuit boards. We can um, do a lot of, uh, of quick turn prototypes for sensors and things yeah. like that. And we do it all the time. So you're doing a fair amount of making and trying your own stuff rather than sourcing? Yeah, so when possible we'll use something that we can buy because yeah. that's the fastest way to get something out there um, and, and get whatever thing we're trying to measure measured. Um, but often it's just not available. So we're, you're making stuff here. Yes, like yes, we make, we make all kinds of stuff. Let me show you one thing that we've made. We've got um, a uh, device that we made and designed to measure water flow through a water meter. Okay. So the way a water meter works is there is basically a, a propeller slash impeller kind of deal in the meter body. And deal is a technical term. Deal is a technical term. Um, uh, and there is another one in what's called the register, which sits on top. Okay. Okay. And so those two magnets, just like grade school science, they'll link up with each other. And as the water flows through, they spin. 
and they're spinning the gears in this register so mm -hmm. that when the meter reader comes by once a month, they look at the numbers and they give you the, the meter read, they write it down. And, and or they'll I take a picture of it. Your showers are too long. Right. And, <laughs> and then you get your water bill. And, and if you've got a leak or anything like that, you don't know for a month, right? Sure. Unless you know to go look at this and, and how to interpret this, you just don't know. So we designed uh, this device, we call it the blue band, that sits on top of this meter and it can measure very, very small changes in magnetic field. So as those magnets are spinning, we can see them the magnetic field changing and we can see that that rotation is happening. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting a reading once a month, we get a reading every four ounces. So if, so I, that's, if I spill this mug, you know it. <laughs> basically, if you fill that mug, we'll know it, yes. right? Um, if you've got a small leak, which can really add up over time, right, um, to tremendous amounts of water, we'll actually know that too. And we'll know it within days because there's, in, in a residential structure, over a 24 hour period, there should be a time where there's no water usage at all. There right. should be multiple times a day where there's no water usage at all. And if you don't have that, you've got to leak. Assuming that you had permission or someone got permission to produce these at scale and enough water utilities allowed them to put on, is this a cheaper solution? It's because sometimes you can retrofit a thing and it's more expensive oh, than buying is, a new thing. <laughs> right. Um, this is a much cheaper solution since it, 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 it fits on the meter that's already there. Mm -hmm. The moment you have to dig that hole, cut those pieces of pipe and put a new meter in, right. that's a very expensive retrofit. Like wiring anything, an EV charger. Any, like wiring an EV <laughs> charger, right? Um, anything that just snaps on yep. to the top of the meter and is an install that is fast as that, yeah. that saves a lot. And of it's not intrusive, so why no, should they uh, be so bothered? They can still look th look at the, the meter the legacy way. They can still, it does not interfere with the normal operations. Yeah. We couldn't squeeze all of Austin's organic goodness into a single episode, so we're going to ring in the new year with more of our adventures in Texas. So subscribe to Fully Charged on YouTube, click the bell icon to receive notifications, and don't forget to get your tickets to our Austin live show at fullycharged.show. Y'all really should come join us. Well, it's a fascinating story, and there are books written about it. We have a very progressive community. They're very forward-looking. Right now, you're being shaded by a solar-powered kiosk. We have solar power running above us. We have storage in here, okay. and that storage is running to 50s-era fuel pump that you can now plug bikes and scooters in. As always, thank you for watching. <laughs>